hopefully give you a little peek into some of the things you might be seeing on your uh, trees in your yard or in your, in your woods out back as well. Um, before we go anywhere though, I always like to start with a little disclaimer. I'm going to give you all sorts of science-based stuff, but I've also been doing this type of thing for 20 some years. So I've got opinions and you might get them, especially when it comes to how to control things or, or my thoughts on stuff, but we'll try to keep it lighthearted, but just know, I'll let you know if it is an opinion. So I want to start with a basic question today. That question is, what's eating my trees? And we, I get this all the time from people. Why do my trees not look perfect? Why is there a leaf gone? What's happening here and what's happening there? And when we think about trees, um, especially trees that are planted in yards or more managed areas, when you have something like this, they are behind the eight ball for a lot of reasons. They have to deal with all sorts of things. They've got to deal with different amounts of precipitation, right? Not every bit of rain that falls on this, these trees here, this completely brick environment is going to get to those roots, right? So they've got precipitation issues, possible flooding issues, wind whipping through cities, whips through a lot different than it does in the, in the outdoor, in the native outdoors pollution in the towns, there's all sorts of pests that come to these things. And we're gonna talk about a bunch of pests today. Almost every pest we have in South Carolina is something secondary. That means it's only coming because that tree is weak. We've only got just a few pests that are, that are aggressive enough to take down a healthy tree. By and large, if your tree is healthy, it's not gonna be damaged by stuff that eats it a whole lot. Humans are actually one of the biggest uh, issues to trees, especially in towns, in a city like Clemson, where we have, or we used to have, uh, you know, football games every Saturday. It was once told to me by Tony Tidball, the horticulturalist there, that 18 to 24 year old students are the biggest danger to street trees in Clemson because of things they do on Saturday during, uh, during and after the game. And then temperature, of course, gets a lot warmer in cities, uh, in these urban managed areas than it does out in the native land. So so with all this in mind, especially in those managed areas, I'm talking lawns too, most of these trees are perpetually stressed, right? They're not, not always clipping at a full deck. And we've, I think we've talked about this before, this decline spiral. There's a lot of different things that impact trees. Again, few things are gonna kill it out, right? These things I've circled in blue on the outskirts, these are things that we call predisposing factors, right? It's something like just the environment in general, the genetics of the tree, right? Some trees just die younger than other trees because they weren't, you know, made right genetically. Soil compaction, soil issues, all these are sort of predisposing things. They're not going to kill a tree alone, but they weaken it a little bit. And then as you get in that middle, you get these inciting factors. And this is something that, think of this as like a one-time big event that really damages it. A big outbreak of a defoliator or some sort of damage from, from construction, an excavator, that type of thing, or a late or early frost. Those are things that can also serve as, uh, as inciting factors too. And then you get these contributing factors, and that's just things that come when a tree is already on its way down, right? These are things we usually notice though, the canker fungi, uh, the big beetles that bore through there, you'll see the sawdust coming out of the holes. We notice these things because they're sort of big and obvious there, they are only coming to that tree because the tree got weak in the first place. And, you know, to that end, these pests and these insects and fungi and all this stuff, they don't care where the trees are. It might be out in the middle of the woods. It might be in the middle of town. It might be in the urban rural interface, right? Suburbia. If there's a tree that, that becomes susceptible, there's going to be a bug or a fungus that's going to try to take care of it, to try to, try to consume it. So, with that, let's talk about some common stuff you might see on your trees. If we're ready, all ready then, let's get going. So since we're talking about bugs, so I wanna address the elephant in the room, um, and that is the Asian longhorn beetle. Now, I hope many of you have heard of this already. We uh, became the sixth state to have Asian longhorn beetle as of late May this year. It is a large, about an inch and a half long beetle. That was, uh, that was the beetle on my fingers I showed you native to Asia, extremely wide host range, meaning it will eat a lot of different tree species. Uh, we are working closely with the regulatory folks from the state to the Department of Plant Industry and the federal government, the USDA APHIS, to try to eradicate this thing. Uh, it's actually got bluish feet, if you see it in the light, and the antenna are black and white stripes. So where is it, is the next question I get asked. It is 
uh, the infestation is right around Hollywood, South Carolina. So about 15, uh, 20 miles down Highway 17 from Charleston. There's a, there's a fairly sizable spot right there. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the adults, they, they chew these, we call them egg niches. So they sit there on the bark and they chew and they chew and they basically chew little divots in the bark. Um, and then they whip around and they put an egg in the middle of that thing. And you can see on some cases, we've got all sorts of niches just going all up this tree. Uh, the egg will go in there, the egg will hatch, the larvae will start feeding, the larvae get quite large. Here's one on a, on a hand with a dime. So these things get pretty big. And they basically Swiss cheese the tree. So you'll get all sorts of, uh, you know, they'll go back and forth through the wood. And what they do is they structurally degrade that tree. So you see these branches broken off. That's what we have. So it's coming to be hurricane season. So it's a fairly big concern that we've got a lot of trees standing there that have uh, very weak structural integrity. Um, you also have these big exit holes. These things are big enough to where you could stick a pencil in there. So they're pretty good size, perfectly round. Um, the adults do feed a little bit just on some of that nice green uh, bark on the young shoots, but their damage is negligible. Now, what do you do if you have it? Well, first of all, if you've seen one of these, please tell me or tell Clemson DPI or USDA APHIS, call your local extension agent, tell someone if you've seen one of these great big things. Can you prevent it from, from damaging one of your trees. Yes, there's some chemical uh, management tactics that do work fairly well. Once it's in a tree, can you save the tree? I'm afraid not. So if you are a landowner down here and you've got these things in your trees, the only thing we can do is remove those trees and destroy them. So with that doom and gloom behind us, let's move on to some other things we may see. We, these are some, we're gonna go over next a bunch of caterpillars that'll we find them uh, defoliators across the state. The forest tent caterpillar is one of these. Now I know it's called the forest tent caterpillar, but it does not make a tent. So uh, this is native, we find it all over the place and they eat so many different things, it's easier to say what they don't eat, which is red maple, sycamore, and conifers. Pretty much every other hardwood thing, they will eat it if they're there. This life cycle is fairly, fairly typical. They overwinter as this little egg mass on a branch. In the spring, they hatch and they eat. That's the caterpillar's only job for, for all caterpillars. Their job is to eat and get as big as they can and then they'll make their cocoon or their chrysalis and then they hatch or then they emerge from the cocoon or chrysalis. They mate, lay eggs again. Now these uh, outbreaks are cyclical. So that means they can come and they go, right? They might be around for a few years. We haven't had one in South Carolina for a long time. Uh, North Carolina has had several in the last uh, few years. So one big defoliation is not gonna kill a tree. And you can see here, these blue arrows are pointing to, this is the middle of summer, and these are hardwood trees completely stripped by forest tent caterpillars. Um, they're also quite a nuisance because at some point they've all got to make a cocoon. And so they will crawl all over everything Every single one of these little white dots on that house is a caterpillar cocoon, and as my wife would say, ew, right? So we also have the eastern tent caterpillar. This is closely related to the forest tent caterpillar, but it does make a tent, and these are the tents you probably see first thing in the spring, a lot of times on black cherry trees, uh, you know, on the side of the road. They put that tent right in the crotch of the branches there. Uh, it's a very similar looking caterpillar very similar lifestyle, basically the same lifestyle. They put these egg masses on the branches, caterpillars hatch and eat, cocoons, adults do the same thing. The easy way to tell them apart is if you have them, um, you can look at their back, right? So we want to know what the difference is. The eastern tent caterpillars are easy to control because you can just clip off that tent if you want and the caterpillar can be in there. But the forest tent caterpillars are a little more difficult they're kind of all over the place. But the easy way to tell these apart, the Eastern tent caterpillar has a white line going all the way down its back. And the forest tent caterpillar has what looks like tiny little white boot prints. Something, a little tiny gnome stepped in white paint and walked all the way up it. That's what that looks like. What can we do about tent caterpillars? Well, one option is to do nothing, right? I mean, they'll, they come and they go, they will probably pass. There's lots of natural enemies out there. For the tents, if you just take a stick and rip those open, a lot of times birds and wasps will get in there and, and take care of the larvae. If you really need to, you can treat it with insecticide, but um, more than likely, you don't really need to do anything. There's also some banding and techniques you can do on certain trees. 
Canker worm is another thing we see. These are generally called loopers or inchworms. So if you've ever seen an inchworm, that is a canker worm, a fall canker worm. These are native again. They eat a lot of different things. And in some places you get repeated, repeated, repeated defoliations here. Uh, the life cycle is extremely similar. The big difference is that the females don't fly, right? So they have little teeny tiny wings. You can barely see them. They pupate in the soil, they just crawl up a tree and then they give out a chemical pheromone and odor. Males fly to them, mate, and then the female lays eggs in that same tree. Management is very similar. A lot of times we don't do much of anything. There's lots of natural enemies and there's certain things you can do if you've got issues with your, your own tree. So now we'll talk about pine sawflies. This is the main defoliator we have of pine trees here in South Carolina. Uh, all pines are susceptible. Uh, there's several species of sawflies out there and the damage is usually pretty spotty. You don't see it consistently. It'll pop up here, it'll pop up there. One defoliation is not going to hurt the tree more than likely, but again, if it happens over and over and over again, especially on a younger tree, you can see some, some damage then. These are actually not caterpillars. They are larvae of a little stingless wasp. So you can see that wasp uh, in the uh, upper left-hand corner there. They look like caterpillars, don't get me wrong, but they are not. We've got the, we've got the red-headed pine sawfly. There's also this black-headed pine sawfly, cleverly named for the black head. Loblolly pine sawfly, I guess they just ran out of, you know, we already have a red-headed one, so they can't call it that. It's got a black stripe on the back of it. But this is what you see with sawflies. They all feed together. That's called gregarious. They feed gregariously. And the young larvae don't have very big jaws yet, so they can't eat the whole needle. So what they do is they chew the edge of the needle and they basically leave half of it that turns kind of brown and, and crispy. As the larvae get older, they have larger jaws, larger mandibles, and they can consume the whole thing like a carrot, right? So at that point, you're gonna see little nubs. So the young ones eat like an ear of corn, the older ones eat like a carrot. So that's why you see these different types of damage on here. Here's just a couple pictures of damage. This is a longleaf pine plantation that got pretty much stripped here in the, in the forefront. And then here's a white pine tree that was pretty much defoliated in the middle of summer. So they can do a lot of damage. Again, they, they don't usually hang around. They kind of come and they go. Bagworms are very common. I would guess a lot of people have seen these things. Uh, we call this a nuisance pest, right? It can come and it can go uh, prefers juniper, arborvitae, and conifers, but we will see it on hardwoods. I've, I saw one on my, uh, my black gum out here in the yard just the other day. Uh, they spend almost their whole life in that bag they create out of whatever they're feeding on. So in this particular picture, you can see it looks like a bunch of little arborvitae needles they've glued together outside of them. Uh, the females stay in the bags their entire life. They're the larva, they pupate in there, then they just put out a pheromone, they call the males. The males will actually emerge from that bag when they have come out of the pupa, fly to the females, crawl in that bag, mate, and then she lays her eggs inside there. Uh, to get rid of these, honestly, the easiest thing to do is just pick the bags off. That's all you gotta do. If you wait till it gets this late though, it's not a lot you can do because they've pretty much killed that arborvitae, right? So if there's a bunch of them there, they will really, really mow down on that stuff. This is at a, uh, gas station on the side of the road I stopped at a few years ago. I saw just this one particular plant completely destroyed. Uh, there's a few bags on some other others too, but this one is where they seem to congregate. Now we'll talk about the emerald ash borer. Hey, Jay. Hey, David. You've got a couple questions. Um, sure. Going back to the, the first um, species, the Asian beetle. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love, I love, and it looks like we go to the same barber, by the way. We got we that do, yeah. Jordan thing in the going bathroom on. over there, that's where it usually happens. <laughs> hey, um, the, the, the Swiss cheesing, are they Swiss cheesing the, the trunk too, or are they, the larva, are they kind of exiting that hole and climbing up to the limbs and just um, impacting the limbs? No, so the larvae are inside the wood. So, so that adult will lay the egg right on that little egg niche she digs. The first couple instars, couple three weeks, they feed on the phloem and then they turn and go straight into the wood. And whether that's the trunk or a larger branch, uh, they can develop in anything about an inch and a half in diameter. They feed on the wood. So once they go into the wood, they just sort of eat and meander around in there. So the Swiss cheesing, they're inside the tree the whole time and they're consuming the wood is what they're doing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then 
if you have a bunch of different trees and one gets the disease, and I think your picture kind of, um, you know, talks to this a little bit, um, one tree gets the disease, um, are the pests or the disease, are they going to spread to the other trees in the area? Highly unlikely, unless the other trees in the area are also under some sort of stress, uh, right? So this okay. is where we, we really try to tell people to keep your trees healthy. And, and I like to say there's a lot of people out there that'll spend hours every weekend on a flower bed to make sure their flowers are absolutely perfect and impeccable. And then they'll plant a tree and they won't touch it for 30 years, right? So <laughs> right. trees are plants too. They don't need to be sung to every week, but, you know, give them a little love. Make sure if it's, if it's really dry, they're getting some water. Make sure they're mulched the right way. Um, yeah. Try not to damage them with lawnmowers and weed eaters and that thing. Just, you know, they don't need as much as a, you know, rose garden or something, but they could use a little bit every now and again. So if everything's healthy and there's just one tree that's damaged, the bugs will probably just get the one tree and then move on. But if you've got a lot of them damaged, they're just going to sort of work their way through it. Yeah. Okay. No, that's really good to know. Um, and the last question, um, you had mentioned BT and BTK pesticides. What, what are yes. those? Sorry, those are Bacillus thuringiensis. So those are, uh, we call them biorational pesticides. BT is a soil, it's a fungus that's found in the soil and they've been able to take that and create that and make that into a pesticide, but it's mm -hmm. extremely specific. So BT, certain varieties only affect caterpillars. Certain varieties only affect mosquitoes. Certain varieties only affect beetles. So they're very specific things towards a, a certain group of insects. So you can use those uh, depending on what your situation is. Okay, awesome. I appreciate it and I'll see you in just a little bit. All right. All right, thanks. Yep. All right, we're on to the emerald ash borer. So those of you in the upstate uh, hopefully have heard of this. Uh, it's a small green beetle. They're about a half an inch long. This is the one that's hitting all of our ash trees across most of Eastern North America. Here you see the most recent range map we have. It, it basically covers everywhere except Mississippi. Nobody knows what Mississippi is doing, but they're living clean in some way over there because they have not found this thing yet. Florida's not found it. There's not as many ash down there. Plus it just hasn't made its way through Georgia, I think. But what we see is, you know, this small beetle, the big damage comes from the larvae feeding on the phloem. You can see the larva in the top middle there in the upper right hand picture where they just consumed all that phloem and they cut off the, the movement of nutrients in that tree. Uh, the adults feed on the, the leaves just a little bit. They sort of nibble the edges. That does basically no damage to the tree. That larval damage is the stuff that does it. And you can see the lower middle, when they come out of the tree, it's a perfect D-shaped exit hole. So remember D for Dave. That's your emerald ash borer if it's on an ash tree. What do you look for if you have an ash tree? Now remember, these are only ash trees. This is the only genus these particular insects will affect. Uh, they will kill them if, if treatment is not uh, performed. You get this declining or thinning crown. That may not be, you know, there's a lot of things that can do that, but that's one of the, the things to look for. You know, they'll then get these epicormic sprouts. Now, if you see a tree that does this, this is that tree's last gasp for life. And this is for epicormic sprouts in general is a plant or a woody plant's last gasp effort at surviving. It also never works. So at this point, the tree is, you know, the only thing you can do is cut it down and put a new one in there. Um, you'll also see some cracks in the bark. And there, if you look in those cracks, you might see some larval galleries kind of going back and forth. Again, the D-shaped exit hole. And then there's those uh, winding galleries. The bark will eventually sort of flake off. Extra woodpecker activity is a good indicator that you've got a problem with your tree. Because woodpeckers are eating those larvae that are under the bark. If all of a sudden you've got a tree that looks kind of healthy, but there's woodpeckers all over it, there's probably problems with it. That means there's something in there. Those birds can tell if there's bugs in there and they're trying to eat them. In some cases, you'll see what we call ash blonding. And that's where the woodpeckers are actually flaking off sort of the outer half of the bark and they leave this very light colored, it's basically the middle of the bark you're seeing. Uh, but as you're driving down the road, you'll see a, a tree that looks like its bark is extremely light colored. So that's what's happening. How do we manage EAB? It's, it's difficult. There's not a lot you can do. We try to not move firewood around um, and just tell people, you know, they monitor for it. But the main thing is don't move firewood around because if there's an ash tree that gets uh, killed, cut up into firewood, those larvae can be moved to all sorts of new places. 
You can save an ash tree. Um, there's chemicals that we can use. You can inject these. The key here is, is hitting it early, right? At, at the point where a tree loses about 30% of its canopy, you're probably not going to save it. Now, I'll never say never, but uh, it's really tough. Um, and you can see here on the on the left, you've got a 10% thin. This one's a good candidate. You probably save that with the uh, injections of chemicals. Uh, in the middle, boy, you're you're starting to push faith there. And at the end, you're in a pretty big uphill battle. Now, if you are somewhere in the vicinity of EAB, we recommend that if you've got an ash tree in your yard or ash tree anywhere you want to save, you can start preventative treatments when the EAB is 15 miles away. So if you know that there's EAB in the next county over and it's about 15 to 20 miles away and you've got an ash tree in your yard, you can start treating that thing to save it. There's plenty of stuff you can do. There's different methods. There's different chemicals. We can be happy to talk about that more later if there's other questions, but a tree can be saved. It's just that you got to start early. Okay. And again, right now, this beetle is only in the upstate, the, our, our upstate counties that are sort of bordering Tennessee and North Carolina there. Now we'll talk about bark beetles. Bark beetles are super common in pines, they're common in hardwoods, teeny tiny little things. Okay, this is our most common pine bark beetles here. There's the ips on the left and then the dendroctinus or the turpentine beetles and southern pine beetle on the right. Tiny little things that can do a lot of damage, right? This is a southern pine beetle. This is one of the only aggressive things we have down here along with some of the non-native stuff, but this is the one that any pine grower will tell you they worry about because infestations of southern pine beetle can wipe out lots of pine trees. All the other ones, uh, they're just coming to a tree that's stressed, okay? There's different kinds. Um, most of these in the U.S. are native, so especially the pine, they're all just native, native bark beetles we've got here. They are feeding on the phloem, so think of the phloem as a sleeve of life, right? You've got that, that tree and the phloem goes all the way around it up and down, um, and that feeding by the adults and the larva girdles a tree, right? And then trees die because they can't get nutrition. Now, bark beetles are a little bit different than ambrosia beetles. Uh, Size-wise, extremely similar. Uh, there's a lot of really cool uh, morphology if you look at these things under a microscope, but size-wise, they look about the same. The difference, though, is ambrosia beetles, um, these only attack stress trees, okay? So these are not going to, now the exception, of course, of some of our non-natives, but all the, most of the ones we have here, it's a stress tree thing. And whether that's in a natural area, whether that's in a yard, uh, you know, around the, the city square, if that tree is stressed, ambrosia beetles are probably going to find it. Now remember, bark beetles are feeding on the phloem, right? Ambrosia beetles are not eating the tree at all. They are basically hollowing out a little gallery in that tree to grow a fungal garden. So the beetles have these little pockets right here behind their head. There's fungal spores in there. They eat their way into a tree that's dying or even dead in some cases. That fungus starts growing and you can see it on the right here. It's sort of the darkish uh, whitish stuff. They lay their eggs and the little larvae feed on the fungus, not the tree. So one thing you will see uh, with ambrosia beetles is these toothpicks or noodles or frass tubes. Um, if you're not aware, frass is just a fancy entomology word for poop. So that's all we have here. As these uh, insects bore into the tree, each one of those little noodles is where one beetle went in that tree, hollowed out a place, and they started uh, farming their fungus so their larvae can feed on it. Uh, the presence of these indicates that that tree is toast. Okay, so if you have these, there is no coming back from this. This is kind of, think of them as the last thing to the party at this point. If they've gotten here, your tree is, uh, you can start thinking about what to plant next is what I like to tell people. Now, again, there are some differences. And one of the, uh, one of the exceptions here is the red band ambrosia beetle. Okay, this is a non-native to the U.S., highly, uh, highly invasive. It carries with it laurel wilt, which is a very devastating fungus. It's got a very similar life cycle as we already showed. But it affects everything in the family Lauraceae. So that's your, your bay trees, camphor tree, sassafras, avocado trees. All these are in the family Lauraceae. Um, right now, here's the current status of laurel wilt. You can see we've got it through, uh, you know, it's quickly approaching the entire state of South Carolina. Um, very common along the coast. Again, it was found just uh, north of Savannah there uh, almost two decades ago. 
Management wise, boy, not much you can do. If you've got a tree with laurel wilt, you can cut it up and chip it. That would be best. You can't really physically protect anything. These beetles are so small, they fly kind of year round. Um, you can inject a, a prize tree, a tree to say with fungicides, and that will take care of it. Um, there are insecticides that work on the adult beetles, but I'll be honest, they don't work for it. So it's probably not worth your time. If you've got a tree in this family you want to save in your yard, you're probably going to want to inject it with fungicides, especially if you are in that zone where laurel wilt is present. Now, going back to the upstate, you folks that might have hemlocks, we'll talk about the hemlock woolly adelgid quick. This is a little tiny invasive insect from Japan. Um, it's got a really, really crazy life cycle. There's only females. It's got a, a really neat uh, life cycle, two generations a year, but it's got a capable of very rapid population growth. And it looks like little tiny cotton balls at the base of the needle. That's what you'll see. You've got these flat hemlock needles and these little tiny cotton balls right at the base. With a microscope, if you looked under there, you'd see a little teeny tiny bug that looks like this. And it's got a long little thing coming off the bottom. That's its mouth parts. It gets right at the base of the needle and sticks that down in the tree. And then it just starts sucking the sap out of it. Right. And that feeding causes the, the foliage grays and then thins and then the branches die. And then the tree dies, and some might ask, well, who really cares? We don't have many hemlock here in South Carolina, and this is true. But hemlock's a very important component across the eastern U.S., especially in these mountains. And this is what it looks like where there's a lot of hemlock that has been killed by the hemlock woolly adelgid, right? This is up in the Blue Ridge. It's gorgeous, and all these hemlocks have been killed by this little bug. So it's a really devastating thing. Management is very difficult to do because it's one of these things in the – in a lot of natural areas. So there's not much you can do. If you've got a hemlock in your yard you want to save, you can do that. There's ways you can do that. A lot of things you might see, especially on your trees around, you know, where you're at is scales. There are so many different types of scales. We could be here for days talking about nothing but scales, but there's groups of them is, is the easy way to do it. There's these soft scales. Uh, these are going to be, you know, within each of these scales, think of a scale this way. It's basically a little bug sucking the juice out of the tree and then there's some sort of cap or covering over it and they're in there and so they do their thing they'll lay eggs and there's just a little tiny point in time where those things are called crawlers they move around and look for a good spot and then they settle down stick their mouth parts in there and they start forming that cap and they stay there the rest of their lives so you've got soft scales these will make honeydew and that's the stuff that sort of rains down on your car and gets all sticky and gross and disgusting uh, armored scales do not make honeydew. And most, these are most common. Uh, some of those pine scales you might see, they look like little crusty white things on a pine needle. There's these lacanium scales. These are sort of, uh, you know, big, bigger, squishier things is a good way to, uh, to uh, describe them. Uh, also honeydew producers. And then you've got wax scales. So these come, you get these a lot on uh, more ornamental type things. One of the big uh, important scales we have is a crepe myrtle bark scale. So this is one that affects crepe myrtles. It is not native to here. We've got pretty good uh, populations, especially in the Columbia area, but I also think up in Rock Hill they've got some. Um, they, they create so much honeydew that it sort of drips down the tree and then you get this mold that forms on this black mold. We call it sooty mold. And all that is is just mold growing on the, the sugary solution that comes out of there. So. Um, should you control scales? There's different ways to do that. There's different insecticides. There's oils you can use in soaps to physically wash them off. Uh, there's contact insecticides. Again, they have to be done at just the right time to get that little crawler as it's crawling around. Once they have hunkered down and sort of made their case, you can't really get at them with contact insecticides. And there's also some growth regulators. So should you manage the scale? Uh, the best method depends on what exactly you have. Right, so that's the first key. If you've got one of these things on, on a tree or even a bush or something that you're concerned with, get with your local extension agent and figure out what is it first. Here's one that we don't have yet, but it moves around a bit, so I would like to talk about it, but I'll see Jay, so I will take a pause. <laughs> I appreciate that, David. Yeah. Um, all right, well, you know, I saw that picture of the crepe myrtle and it looked horrible and we had one question that says how do you safely dispose of an infected tree so you know whether that's a big large tree or a, or a small tree like that crepe myrtle what's the what's the best way to dispose of those 
You know, that depends on what pest you have on the tree, okay? If it's, if it's an invasive uh, pest, something like laurel wilt, uh, crepe myrtle bark scale, it really shouldn't go anywhere. It should be just either, you know, preferably burned or chipped on site. If it's something like just bark beetles, um, you know, you've got a pine that sort of met its maker and it's got a bunch of bark beetles in it. Those are everywhere all the time. So it doesn't really matter where those go, right? So it depends on what you have that you're trying to dispose of. Okay. I would, I would imagine burning is probably the, the best. I, when, when you chip, um, are you, I guess, killing everything you want to eliminate or? Yeah, for the most part, chipping will kill all this stuff. It, you know, aside from the physical process of getting through the chipping, if anything does happen to make it through, those chips dry out. They either dry out really quickly in a pile on the ones on the outside or the ones on the inside basically cook. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, either way it's killing stuff pretty well. Okay. The um, big, the big thing or... is don't take firewood somewhere else. Don't cut it up into firewood and then take it to grandma's in Louisiana or something like that, right? That's what we don't want to do is move this stuff around. Yeah, okay. Um, and we have one question that says, do scales kill off that crepe, the crepe myrtle? I mean, that crepe myrtle looked dead to me, but do they kill them off? You know, we don't have evidence that says they will flat out kill a crepe myrtle, but I've seen enough... Um, if they don't kill it, they push it really close. I mean, and we've seen, again, we don't have like science, you know, we don't have good replicated studies, but it certainly appears that they can sort of uh, suppress flowering, suppress growth. Um, I think, you know, coupled with a lot of the stress that most crepe myrtles are under anyway, it probably would die. It's always tough to say what actually killed something like that. Um, a lot of times it's a number of factors, but um, they're certainly not a good thing and they are not beneficial and they're just one more card stacked in the deck against it. Okay. And, and one last question here, um, mm -hmm. and I'll let you get to it, but uh, are there any predators that attack the scale insects? Yeah. You know, we'll talk about uh, lady, ladybugs and ladybird beetle larvae later, but there's a number of predators. The, the problem is there's usually just not quite enough predators. And, and so, there's this relationship between sort of predator and prey where those prey populations get so high so fast, it takes the predators a little while to catch up to it. And a lot of times, right when the prey populations, in this case, the scales are super high, the predators are still ramping up. But as a homeowner, you see a tree or your shrub covered in scales, you think, oh my gosh, now what? Um, so, you know, if you take, I personally don't ever treat for scales because eventually the predators do catch up and it just sort of, fixes itself kind of. Um, so it depends on kind of when you get there, but there are plenty of predators, lacewings uh, and ladybirds are, are the two big ones that we can think okay. of. Awesome, awesome, good to know. Okay. Moving on, spotted lantern fly. So this is one we don't have yet. So there's your good news for today. I've been giving you all sorts of doom and gloom. The good news is we do not have this yet, uh, but if we got it, it would be very devastating. So there's the gloom coming back at you. but. Uh, potentially major pests. They're, they're fairly good size. Here's one on the end of my finger. I mean, they're a solid, you know, three quarters of an inch uh, long, at least. Bright colored. The ones, the nymphs without wings are uh, red. They're black and white and they get red towards the end. Uh, the adults have these wings. And here's our current distribution map. And I'm showing you this because on the surface, it looks like, well, they're only in Pennsylvania and Jersey and a little bit up there in Virginia. But if you look really close, Right down there in Western North Carolina, just above the end, they did find um, they did find a live one recently. So they get moved around. They get the, the chance of them coming to South Carolina is is high. I would say it's high. So we want to be keeping our eyes open for this type of thing. Uh, we saw two of the life stages. The adults uh, they lay the eggs. The eggs look like kind of silly putty. They're really tough to tell. It's like kind of a gray. Uh, yeah, gray silly putty is what it looks like. When they first hatch, they're just black and white. As they get a little older, they get a little more red in them, and then they turn to adults where they have those, those wings. They're not great flyers, but they can jump quite a ways, and they'll also uh, crawl to one of the tallest thing around there, a tree or a fence post, jump and fly, and if they catch the wind, they can really travel uh, quite a ways. They do prefer Tree of Heaven. Uh, before everyone gets excited and says, yay, here's a control for this uh, invasive plant. I will just tell you they're a way more tree of heaven than they will ever be controlled by this thing. So, uh, but if we do get them, the odds are we're going to find them on tree of heaven first because they just prefer it so much. So just keep your eye open 
for something like this. If you see something, say something. Uh, anything seems suspect, get a good picture and report it. Galls. So I would guess almost everyone on this call has seen galls in their lifetime. There's all sorts of types. In general, you have open and closed. Um, open galls are produced by insects with piercing sucking mouth. There's an opening through which they can escape. Closed galls are made by things like flies, beetles, wasps, and moths. Wasps and moths, sorry. And these chew their way out of the gall. So some of them have an opening so they can get out. Some of them have to chew their way out. That's the basic gist of thing. And none of these things reproduce in here. This is where the larvae feed, and then eventually they leave. So again, there's all sorts of these. Here's some common ones you may have seen, the maple eye spot gall midge. Okay, this is, uh, usually in early summer, you see these bullseyes on maple leaves, a red and white bullseye. In the very center there is a little teeny, teeny, tiny larva feeding that will come out and it turns into this little midge. A midge looks like a tiny mosquito, basically. You've also got these finger gall mites, black cherry finger gall mites are really common around the black cherries around here. They're the ones that look like those little white or red, you know, fingers sticking up off that leaf. That's a little mite feeding in there. And so what a gall is, is when this insect starts to feed, the, it, it, it gives off some chemicals and it, it injects some saliva. The saliva has chemicals in it. And the plant basically grows a big, like a big scar tissue around that insect. And that's what's happening, or that mite. It's growing around it. And then that insect or mite is just feeding on the stuff inside there. We've also got these maple bladder gall mites. These are pretty common. Uh, the little red, uh, you know, they almost look like the candy nerds. The red nerds on the top of a maple leaf, that's what those look like. If you pop one open, you'll see these little, little critters inside there. And on hickory, you get these big things, these phylloxera galls uh, on the, the petioles. If you cut one of those things open, you'll see all sorts of stuff crawling around. If you've got oak trees, there's the oak apple galls. These are pretty darn common. Uh, when they're newish, they're that bright green, and as they get older, they turn brown. If you look really closely, there's that hole, right? So that was a closed gall where the adult had to chew its way out. Uh, it's a little tiny wasp. I can tell you that from experience because I brought a bunch of these to my office once. I forgot about them, and then they all chewed their way out, and they were covering my office window. So I had all these little tiny uh, wasps all over the place. But if you do cut the green one open, Right in the dead center, there's a larva sitting there feeding on all that tissue that the tree is making. So they kind of trick the tree into producing food for them. And there's also the wool sower gall. So these are those big fuzzy, uh, fuzzy white things with red spots. These are mostly on oaks is where I tend to find them. Again, same thing. Uh, as it happens, I did the same thing with one of these. I forgot at my office, I had stuff all over the place. This is why it's not safe for entomologists to have offices at home. So I don't I'm not allowed to bring stuff like that inside like I am at my office at, uh, at Clemson there. Do you need to control galls? Nah, not really. I mean, they're, they're probably not going to really do anything to your tree. Um, you know, you might damage a few leaves, but by and large, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a lot of resources to control galls. All right, cherry black knot is pretty common around here on cherries. Uh, my, my friend and colleague, James Blake, who I teach the Master Naturalist class with, affectionately refers to this as a dog turd on a stick, which is a pretty good descriptor. That's what it looks like. Uh, eventually this will kill whatever is on the outer end of the place where it's infected. So, you know, on, on the far end of the stick, it will die. We also have this thing called Bisconeoxia canker. Hypoxylin canker is what it used to be called, but it can be gray, it can be black, it can be brown. So a lot of times, especially on oaks and other hardwoods, You'll see this thing, um, it's a super weak parasite. Now, a lot of people will call and say, hey, I've got this black thing that killed my tree. I'm telling you, if you've got this canker, that tree was going to die anyway. This is a super weak canker. It's on, think of it as being everywhere all the time. And it's always trying to grow into the bark on a tree. Healthy trees can fight it off. Uh, it only gets successful, it only has success when a tree is so weak, it just can't fight off the weakest pathogen you can think of. But that's when it gets in there. So if, if your tree has this, it was going to go anyway. Uh, this is just what sort of finishes things off, okay? Now we have anthracnose. This is where you get these, this is a fungus, right? And it causes leaves to curl on the outside, uh, oaks especially. Um, 
again, it curls on the outside and browns. And so we also get questions about leaf scorch, right? What makes our leaves look icky? Uh, Anthracnose is one, the fungus that causes the curling. Leaf scorch, though, is just the death of cells along the margin of the leaf. So this can happen from drought. This can happen from some other stress agent like uh, excavation, if there's construction nearby. Um, often you'll see it in the summer. The key is sort of figuring out why are you getting the scorch? If it's a, a one-time thing from construction, then you'll probably be okay. But if it's this bacterial leaf scorch, uh, it might not be as good. So this is, it looks similar, but what you actually see, if you look on that leaf in the lower right, you will see a little bit of a yellow line between the scorched part and the green part. Uh, we call that a burn line, and this is a, this is a bacterial disease spread by leaf hoppers, and these little things are all over the place. Um, and, and so basically the bacteria invade the xylem, slowly plug up all the pipes of the tree so it can't move water. So this is a chronic disease. Um, you know, will it kill it? I don't know, but it's one of those other stressors that eventually the tree will die of something if it has this. And so we've also got a bunch of different fungi that make leaf spots or, or pustules on there too. These are more common. All of these are more common in wet times. I say that as it's raining right now and it's probably going to rain for the next few days. But one of the common ones is this maple tar spot. It looks like, as you would guess, black tarry spots right on those maple leaves. Um, you know, super common in wet years. Tubaki, a leaf spot on oaks, also super common. Starts out as little brown uh, brown spots and sort of spreads throughout there. You've also got oak leaf blister, which looks like, again, little, these are so cleverly named, right? It looks like little blisters on that oak leaf, and this is all caused by fungus. Uh, a lot of times this fungi overwinter either on the buds or in the leaves below the tree, and then they sort of blow or splash up the next year. So if you've got a tree that has a bad case of this, the best thing you can do rake up and get rid of all those leaves and, and get them out of there because those are just holding the inoculum. They're holding next year's fungal spores in them. So if you can get rid of them, then you got a better chance that tree's probably going to, it's going to be okay. Now we've got butt and root rots. My sons were in here last night when I was doing this and they laughed uncontrollably when I said I would be talking about butt rot, but we're all grown ups here so we can move forward, except I know there was a first grader, so don't laugh. It's not, not that kind of butt. Uh, these are just a bunch of different fungi that come and attack a tree that's already weak. Okay, we talked about this, the, the importance of keeping a tree healthy, right? That's what all this gets down to. So you've got a lot of these button root rots, and this is any decay at the base of a living tree. Uh, the base, uh, the, the large roots, it comes in there through wounds. So this gets back to why should you take care of that tree and mulch it. Lawnmower blight is a thing we affectionately refer to as someone hitting the base of that tree with a lawnmower or with a weed eater, it causes wounds. Fungi get in there and they start growing. And then the big issue, honestly, is that it makes it very weak, right? Because the fungi are consuming that wood and eating that wood and weakening that tree. So you're, you're much more susceptible to blowing down. And one of the last things we'll talk about here as far as negative things is a slime flux or bacterial wet wood. Uh, hardwoods are often affected. It just looks like these big vertical dark streaks. You can see this one on the tree in the back of my property. It's, it can be wet and slimy and spelly. It's just an infection, right? If we get a cut or something that's infected, sometimes it gets kind of gross. That's exactly what's happening right here. The tree is probably going to survive if it's something that you wanted for lumber. If you're going to have some staining in there, it's going to reduce the value. But the best thing you can do for this is just avoid damaging a tree and you'll probably be okay. One type of tree we have that I did not talk about was palms. Technically palms are just big grasses, but we call them trees anyway. If any of you have palms and have palm issues, I would, I would just say rather than ask me, go to this University of Florida thing because they've got all sorts of great palm diagnosis and palm people. Florida's got palms. I would say just go there if you've got palm questions. So we've talked about all sorts of stuff that's been negative. So now let's talk about some of the good bugs we have. Okay, there's some really good ones out there. May or may not have seen these. Let's start with the praying mantis. Uh, hopefully a lot of people have had the pleasure of seeing a praying mantis. They're fascinating things. They're voracious carnivores, right? They're going to eat any bug or sometimes any lizard or little bird they can get their hands on. 
Um, if you've ever seen something that looks like this, it looks like a little uh, tannish foam mass on a stick. That is a praying mantis egg case. So if you see one of these in the winter, they're pretty easy to see when the leaves fall. You can bring this thing, you know, if you bring it inside, that's cool, but be careful because they will hatch and then they will just go everywhere. So be sure you've got it in some sort of container. Also, if you do that, remember that the minute these things hatch, they come out hungry and they will eat each other if they don't have anything else. So uh, keep that in mind. And then ladybird beetles. We mentioned these earlier. There's so many different kinds of ladybird beetles. Some are native, some are non-native. All of these are predators and they pretty much all eat aphids. And aphids are one of those things that can really be a detriment to a lot of our plants. Uh, this is what a ladybird larva looks like. So maybe you've seen these things crawling around. This is basically a baby ladybird beetle, right? And if you look really closely right here, this one is noshing on an aphid as we speak. You can see the aphid's head and kind of front legs are sitting out there as the aphid is feeding on it. And one of the group of insects that are super common uh, are these predatory wasps. Now I know sometimes people don't like having wasps around, but these are all very, very beneficial to us. Okay, they've all got a little different life cycle. Uh, some collect the larva like the ones on top and, and, and actually three out of four, they'll collect the larva and take it back to a nest. They feed on the larva. Uh, the one on the lower, lower left there is parasitizing the larva. Wasps are incredibly great predators and they are very beneficial to, to have for us. And then one, you know, last insect to talk about are these big old beetles, right? And these are a couple I was lucky enough to see this year. We've got a stag beetle on the left, uh, eastern Hercules beetle on the right. The beetles themselves don't do a whole lot, but the larvae from these beetles are huge grubs, and they feed in dead stumps and, de and dead logs. So, you know, when a tree falls in the forest, um, something has to help break that thing down. And this is the type of insect. A lot of these great big beetles you might see, their larvae are feeding on dead decaying wood and they're helping convert that dead log into more soil. Okay, so this is a, it's a very important role that these things have uh, as part of our ecosystem and part of our environment. So what can we do? We talked about all sorts of stuff that's good for trees, bad for trees. What can you do if you have trees Promote good tree care and silviculture. That just means take care of those trees. If it's dry and droughty, water them. Uh, fertilize them once a year if they're in your yard. Mulch around them in the right way, right? Put the right tree on the right site. If you live in the upstate and you want a yard full of palm trees, maybe reconsider that because your weather maybe isn't quite right for palm trees, right? So think about what tree would naturally go there. Make sure, again, it has adequate resources, minimize the damage to it. And if you really want to get deep into the weeds on this, the International Society of Arboriculture and Society of American Foresters has a whole host of guidelines laid out that are, that are widely acceptable. And with that, I will take any other questions that you may have. And thank you for your attention, folks. Hey, uh, yeah, so we have a few. Um, we had one uh, that was asked uh, by a few people. Um, can you talk about dogwood blight? And if you have trees that have it in your yard, um, you know, once they die um, or even before they die, should you replace them with more dogwoods? Yeah, dog, dogwood anthracnose is what you're looking at there. And so um, that's a disease that's pretty common. If you are, if you really want a dogwood in there, they, they have created cultivars that are resistant to dogwood anthracnose. So if you want a dogwood there, um, you need to get a cultivar that is resistant. I believe they're called KUSA, K-O-U-S-A dogwoods. I believe that's the one, but I think if you just look up, you know, anthracnose resistant dogwood, you will find them. Um, the one thing you don't want to do is just go to the woods and dig up a dogwood and put it in your yard because those are going to be totally susceptible and they might even have anthracnose on them already. And so you could you could be killing that tree and also spreading it to all your neighbors for all you know right so you know dogwoods are a totally fine thing to have but i would say you need to in this case you need to get a cultivar that's already it's been created to be resistant to that otherwise you're just rolling the dice with every other dogwood you put in there okay um and with those cultivars um are they do they still act as host plants to you know uh the the dogwood um, caterpillars that, that typically eat those? 
Yep, yep. The, I, the, my understanding is they have been, uh, they have been, uh, you know, they've done the selective breeding, so they're resistant to the anthracnose, but everything else still eats them. Awesome, man. That's a yep. that's a good thing. Um, yeah. All right. Let's see here. Any suggestions for fire light or maybe blight um, on pear trees? Yeah, fire blight on pear trees. Not really. Fire blight's a tough one. Um, uh, maybe ask that person what kind of pear tree they're talking about. If it's a, if it's a Bradford or a European, but there's not a lot you can do for fire blight other than get fire blight resistant cultivars, which I believe yeah. are out there. Okay. All right. Good. Um, and we had one earlier, uh, ways to treat root rot. Um, are there any ways? Preventative management is really all you can do with root rot. Um, the whole key with the button root rots is to keep those trees healthy so they don't get it in the first place. Once they have, once they got it, those fungi are going to consume dead tissue and that's just what they do. So there's not much you can do once it's, once you have it, that's one of those, you know, prevention is, a, is the best medicine type of deals. But if it's safe to keep up once it dies, you know, leave it for uh, some homes for some cavity nesters. Yeah, uh, and, and that's the thing, you know, it all depends on which, uh, what's, the, what's the scenario there, right? Is it in the front yard right next to your house in the street? Probably don't want to keep that one up. But is it, you know, in the back of your lot or something? Yeah, then, then you've got a little more leeway. So just use, you know, reasonable judgment as to what you do with that. But sure. Um, hang tight if, if you can, David. We got, sure, we got sure. quite a few questions. Um, are dogwood saplings, if you know this, uh, provided by the South Carolina Forestry Commission, are those disease resistant? Do you know? I don't know. You'd have to ask them uh, exactly okay. what they're giving out. Okay. Um, give me just a second. I have a sweet gum with chanterelle mushrooms growing from its roots, or so it appears. Um, is that tree on its way out? <laughs> um, maybe. It's, it's, always <laughs> tough, it's always tough to tell without actually seeing it, you know, because, you know, in, especially with the sweet gum, they're so hardy. They're so tough to kill. Uh, it could be that it's just growing on some dead root tissue and that tree might be totally healthy. So it, it's really tough to tell. I would ask that person, what is the, does the tree look like it's on its way out or does it look full and green and fine? In which case, um, that might help you make that determination. Well, you know, and if and if I can just ask a question as well, you're talking about a full um, and tree that's green and, and fine looking. There's a um, American beach uh, near a creek behind our yard, and uh, all of a sudden we had a, a big flood, you know, down there, and there was a lot of water around it. And we walked down there a lot, and there was this black, and you kind of hit on some black powder earlier. Um, and I don't know if it was tank or not, but it just stayed low at the roots, and there were ants all over, wasps, moths. Um, you know, what else? I wrote it down. Uh, yeah, I, I, there are so many insects. I, do you have any idea what that could be? And it wasn't just on the, the bottom six inches of the tree. It was also on some leaves around the tree. Yeah, that sounds like sooty mold. So it sounds like up above, there was probably some sort of uh, aphids or scales or something. And, and think of aphids and scales like a little tube, right? They've got one end stuck into the tree. They're sucking out the fluid. Yeah. They're taking what they want and basically pooping out sugar water. And all that sugar water drips down, coats everything, you know, rocks, sticks, leaves, the tree, whatever, and then mold grows on it. And it's usually that mold. And because that's, but because it's based in sugar water, it's sugary. So it attracts all these other insects yeah. that are feeding on either it or things that are feeding on it. A lot of times the wasps will be feeding on the, the sugary stuff there. And then they'll also eat something else that was crawling by, right? So it just becomes this home to all sorts of stuff, but they're all because you've got basically a sugar solution coating yeah. everything down there. Okay. Yeah. Really cool. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Uh, th thank you for that. Um, are yeah. dead pine snags in the yard hazardous to nearby trees, pines, and hardwoods? Um, you know, they are not going to kill your nearby pines and hardwoods if they're a dead snag. The only hazard is going to be if it falls and falls into them. It can cause a big, uh, you know, it could cause a physical wound. Um, when I, I've been, whenever I hear dead pine trees or snags in my yard, I would say how big of a yard and how close to the road, right? That type of thing. Um, but if it's, you know, somewhere out back, they're not going to, other than, you know, it might fall into the other tree and, and break branches, cause a wound. It's not going to, bring something in that's going to kill them. Okay, okay. Um, and is the emerald ash borer uh, spread being tracked and surveyed? Should the coastal area be on alert for inve eventual infestation? 
Yeah, it's being tracked and, and surveys happen every year. Um, I think the whole state should be, honestly, the whole region should be on alert if we don't have it yet because uh, it, it can move several miles a year on its own. Our big concern with that is people moving firewood. Um, ash is a pretty good firewood and, and when a tree gets infected, it dies pretty quickly. So that's the big um, uh, concern we have as far as it moving. But yes, please be on the lookout. Again, it's only ash trees. So if you see an ash tree start to fail, take a look. If you see some of those signs, you know, then let somebody know. Okay, appreciate that. Um, sorry, there's there's a bunch of questions. I, no, if, that's cool, if, man. I got time. Okay, awesome. If I don't get to anybody's right, or, or if I kind of gloss right over it, apologies, you know, from me. Um, but we'll we'll go back and and try to get to everybody's. I have a declining oak that a couple times this what spring had areas of bubbles coming out of a spot. Oops, bubbles came out near the bottom. Bubbles came out near the bottom and about head high, stopped within a day. Do you know what that might be? That sounds like slime flux, because a lot of times slime flux will bubble a little bit. It's just, you know, bacterial, all the bacterial stuff going on there. You get bubbles sometimes. Okay. And again, y'all will have a link um, after afterwards, and we'll pop this um, video on our YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it again, take some notes. Um, you know, you can do that. Um, let's see. And do we just have the green and white ashes here? You know, there's some of the more rare ones too. I think there might be a pumpkin ash out there a little bit. So there's, there's some of the other stuff there too, but it's pretty rare, I think. Okay. All right. Mostly green and white though. That's predominantly what you're going to see. Okay. Um, and I think that is it. Again, apologies uh, to anyone that I that I didn't um, get to, um, but we'll have. Well, you've got David's uh, information right here if you, you'd like to uh, ask him a direct question, and um, we'll have this on YouTube. So, uh, man, David, this is the first time I've actually met you face to face. I know. Uh, hey, Jay. Too bad. It's, it's a COVID. It's not face to face, right? <laughs> right. So nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Um, anything that you'd like to say? No, man. I mean, just, you know, keep your trees healthy, treat them good. Like I said, you don't have to sing to them every week, but like, you know, give them a shot of fertilizer once a year. It wouldn't hurt. Mulch them, water them. Um, and then just keep in mind that a lot of stuff eats trees and that's totally natural. Like a little bit of defoliation is not going to hurt a tree. If you've got a few leaves that are tattered or a few a couple of branches that have been eaten, that's fine. Right. Um, it's not going to hurt them. It's just some of those really aggressive invasives. And if something, and honestly, if something looks off, that's when it might be worthwhile contacting your local extension agent or something. So awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, we got a lot of thank yous coming through. Um, y'all, uh, you know, I know Sarah had said it before, but you know, we, we can't put these free webinars, um, on without y'all's financial support. Um, we can't have awesome, you know, uh, guests like David come on without that. So um, help us educate South Carolina. And obviously, you know, it looks like bordering states and some, some other states in the Southeast um, by supporting us, please. And uh, I think we're gonna try to have some kayak classes coming up soon. I think that's the only way that we can think of to do some socially distancing uh, <laughs> classes. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, David, uh, thanks so much, man. Uh, appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll get this link out and uh, an email out to all the guests that were on today. All right. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great weekend. All right. Have a good weekend. All right. Bye.